We see it every now and then, but it's not that common. Historically, if NBA superstars were unhappy in their current situation, they would go to management and request a trade. However, there are certain times when things don't go their way. Maybe the front office doesn't want to trade them, and sometimes this leads to a lot of tension between the player and team. In recent years, we've seen superstars just straight up sit out games to force a trade, or threaten to not report to the team, cause their trade demand was getting stalled. At that point, their team loses all the leverage, and they have no choice but to trade them. In this video, we're gonna take a look at situations similar to that. How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today, here are 10 times when NBA superstars forced a trade. Number 10, Kyrie Irving. Things were looking great for the Cavs by the end of the 2017 season. I mean, yeah, they just got crushed by Golden State, but they did win the championship in the previous year. But with the addition of Kevin Durant, it was a huge obstacle for them to overcome. Everyone knew that. However, for Kyrie, he was thinking about something else. Throughout his time in Cleveland, ever since LeBron returned, the spotlight has always been on him instead. While Kyrie was the secondary star, at times, he felt he wasn't getting the recognition he deserved, and that everything was about LeBron this or LeBron that, he started to get frustrated. And since he already has a ring under his belt, he was now seeking a new start. According to former GM David Griffin, he explained why Kyrie left. It became really evident to Kyrie that he wasn't going to have the template from which to find out how great he can truly be, because he wasn't going to have the ball enough. And when you're trying to be a point guard who makes everybody better, that can be complicated. So I think once we won the championship, it became clear to him that maybe he was going to need to do something else. That something else was to lead his own team. On July of 2017, he requested a trade and made it clear to the Cavs that he was not going to be back next season, regardless. So the organization had no choice and had to let him go. The funny thing is, even in Boston, he got overshadowed. And then in Brooklyn, he was back to being the second or third best player. So I guess he never really accomplished his goal. Number 9, Dwight Howard. Ah, uh, the good old Dwight Mayer saga. This spanned for the entirety of the 2011-12 lockout-shortened season, as the tension reached an all-time high. Dwight Howard, at the peak of his career, clashed with the organization and desperately wanted out. Well, at least that's what we thought. He cited the reason being, the team wasn't working hard enough to build a contender, which is fair and reasonable. But the issue was, he kept changing his mind. According to a report, he would demand a trade, but then after a great streak, he backed off on his demand, but then after another bad stretch of games, he would go back to the front office and demand another trade. Overall, in this one season, he demanded a trade at least three separate times, to either the Nets, the Mavs, or the Lakers. For most of the year, the Nets were his primary destination, which was kinda weird, considering they were even worse than the Magic at the time. Not only that, but near the end of the season, he got his coach, Stan Van Gundy, fired. He told the front office if he was gonna stay in Orlando, he demanded Van Gundy be fired. But he ended up not staying anyway. And Van Gundy was a great coach, so this rightfully pissed off everyone. Then, Dwight got back surgery at the end of the season, so he missed the playoffs too. Ultimately, with everything going on, this was the deciding factor. The Magic always intended to keep him, but with all these shenanigans plus the uncertainty of his back problems, they eventually traded him to LA. This was a deal that was initially thought of as a very bad deal for the Magic, but over the years, it turns out it was pretty bad for everyone. Number 8, Chris Webber. As the first pick of the 1993 draft, Chris Webber came in strong. Right off the bat, he had a successful rookie season, averaging over 17 points and 9 rebounds a game, winning Rookie of the Year, helping the Warriors get back into the playoffs again. It seemed like he was going to be the cornerstone of the franchise for the foreseeable future, and everything seemed to be going well. Except, behind the scenes, there was a lot of drama. Reportedly, Weber, at 6'10", around 230 pounds, 
he was an incredibly versatile player. He could pass and had the ball handling skills of a wing player. That's why he felt like he should play power forward like a point forward type of style from the high post. I mean, when it came to size, he definitely was more of a power forward than a center, as most centers back then were pretty massive. However, coach Don Nelson <laughs> did not think so. Even back in the 90s, he was experimenting with small ball, and insisted that Weber play center, a position he really did not enjoy. As a result, Weber activated his one-year escape clause to leave the Warriors. They had no choice but to honor his request. This was a classic example of a player and coach not getting along, and losing Weber set the franchise back for a long time. Number 7, Anthony Davis. Most of us saw this happen right in front of our eyes, and we know how disastrous this entire season was for the Pelicans. Initially, the 2018-19 campaign started off as usual for the Pelicans. But as the losses piled up and the trade deadline approached, Davis demanded a trade. While he stated afterwards that he didn't want the trade request to be public, his agent, Rich Paul, had a different idea. He informed NBA insider Woj and went public with the request, in hopes of pressuring the Pelicans to trade him before the deadline. Rich Paul was widely speculated to have leaked this trade request, and he told ESPN, Anthony wants to be traded to a team that allows him a chance to win consistently and compete for a championship. Anthony wanted to be honest and clear with his intentions, and that's the reason for informing them of this decision now. That's in the best interests of both Anthony's and the organization's future. The Pelicans organization issued a statement in response. Relative to specific talks of a trade, we will do this on our timeline. One that makes sense for our team and it will not be dictated by those outside of our organization. We have also requested the league to strictly enforce the tampering rules associated with this transaction. This led to Davis getting fined $50,000 for making a public trade demand, which was against the rules. The Pelicans benched Davis for nine consecutive games as the deadline approached, but they still couldn't find a trade. However, since they didn't want to risk Davis getting injured or anything that would tank his trade value, they sparingly played him for the rest of the season. Until he finally got traded over the summer. It was a very awkward situation, but this saga made it very clear that players have all the power in the world. And even with the fine, it's not much for him, so Davis hardly got punished at all. It led to questions on whether or not this type of behavior is okay, and executives across the league felt very uncomfortable about it. Number 6, Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi's exit from the Spurs was kind of similar to Davis's exit from the Pelicans, but it was more complex. It started off as being an absolute shocking trade demand. The Spurs just came off of having a spectacular season, and despite getting swept by the Warriors, that was mostly because Kawhi got injured. They were still one of the top teams in the league and expected to bounce back when Kawhi recovers. Over the summer, the Spurs gave control of Kawhi's injury rehab process to his management team, instead of the Spurs' own doctors. Afterwards, the timeline for his rehab process was very strange. Greg Popovich and the Spurs had no idea what was going on, as Kawhi's uncle and his other managers weren't telling them anything. There was a lot of speculation on what was going on, everything from him having a degenerative quadricep injury to possibly sitting out games on purpose. Nobody knew outside of Kawhi and his managers. By January of 2018, with the lack of communication, the rift between him and the organization grew. Despite being medically clear to play, Kawhi still wasn't playing, and he wasn't even cheering for his team during the playoffs. This tension came to a climax in March, where the Spurs held a players-only meeting where Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili called him out and questioned why he wasn't playing. Then, Parker made a jab that his own quad injury was 100 times worse than Kawhi's, yet Tony recovered quickly. It was a conflicting year for the Spurs, and the cracks were too big to ignore. There was no room for reconciliation. At the end, Kawhi's trade request was granted. 
Well, sort of. He wanted to go to LA, which did not happen immediately, so I guess it wasn't granted in the way he wanted. But then, he still won the championship in Toronto, and shortly afterwards, he went to Los Angeles, like he wanted. Number 5, Carmelo Anthony. Melo's time on the Nuggets was actually very good. He led them to seven consecutive playoff appearances, but by 2011, the team was stagnant, and Melo sought for a different scenery. Born in Brooklyn, Melo always had a connection to New York, and really wanted to be in that spotlight. Even though the Knicks wanted to wait until the offseason to sign him, Melo pushed hard for a trade because he wanted to sign an extension in New York and eventually get another massive contract a few years down the road. As a result, the Nuggets were forced to trade him, and the Knicks were forced to give up so many assets, almost their entire starting lineup and multiple picks for Melo. The thing is, neither team wanted to do this trade in the first place. The Knicks preferred to wait it out until the offseason to sign him. But the threat of Melo possibly signing with the Nets was too risky for them. The Nuggets, of course, never wanted to deal him in the first place, because they felt like they were in a good spot and wanted to re-sign him. The only winner of this trade was Melo himself. Number 4, Vince Carter. At one point, Vince Carter was the most hated man in Canada. After his six seasons in Toronto, VC racked up five All-Star selections, numerous All-NBA selections, but the Raptors as a team were rapidly falling off. By late 2004, Carter wanted to leave, but it was mostly because he was fed up with upper management. With a new GM, Rob Babcock, the Raptors were supposedly going to change and move into a new direction. But instead, nothing changed at all. Carter made a public trade demand, but the Raptors had no obligation to trade him, as he was worth a tremendous amount of value. With nowhere to go, Carter decided to take matters into his own hands. He would purposefully play poorly and not give any effort at all. He was sandbagging and making a joke out of himself and the entire team. It was very evident he wasn't trying at all, because right after he got traded to the New Jersey Nets, he put up the best numbers of his NBA career. You could see a quick comparison of his numbers in the 2004-5 season, before and after the trade to the Nets. I'm not sure what's worse, purposely sitting out games because you want to get traded, or playing in the games and giving zero effort whatsoever. Fortunately, the relationship between him and the city of Toronto slowly healed over time. Everyone realized that, regardless of his actions, he brought basketball to the entire country, and brought a level of excitement for a sport that was rapidly expanding. Number 3, Charles Barkley. In Barkley's first eight years in Philly, he had the time of his life. He was mentored by Dr. J and Moses Malone early in his career. He met his future wife in Philly. He was making boatloads of money, millions of dollars, to lift his family out of poverty. And he developed into an absolute superstar, a top 5 player in the league during his prime. But by the early 90s, after years and years of struggling to make a championship run, Barkley got fed up. In an interview decades later, he recalled his time in Philly and this is what he said. The only regret I have is, I would have been traded out of Philly sooner, because my last two years there were miserable. I was going to be traded every week. I finally had enough and said, I'm not playing here anymore. Not only that, but he felt like the Sixers' best days were behind them. So at the peak of his career, in the summer of 1992, Barkley demanded a trade and let the Sixers know he wouldn't be back for training camp. The team had to cave in to his demands and find a suitable deal for him. That summer, they actually thought they had a deal with the Lakers. For about two weeks, Barkley thought he was going to LA. But instead, Philly retracted the deal and accepted another trade with the Suns. It was a tumultuous summer for Barkley, but they needed to get a deal done. This trade ultimately turned out quite poorly for the Sixers as they had very little leverage since everyone knew Barkley was gone anyway. They didn't get much back in return. Number 2, Shaquille O'Neal. The 03-04 Lakers saw them compile an absolute star-studded super team. But as we all know, that ended badly, with a 5-game series loss in the NBA Finals to the Pistons. 
This team, widely regarded as one of the greatest we've ever seen, fell to the lowly Pistons, a team that very few people believed in. Afterwards, the Lakers imploded. The biggest storyline all summer, and not just all summer, but all season long, was the relationship between Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. The two of them didn't get along off the court, as both were fighting to be the franchise cornerstone. Shaq didn't like how Kobe was getting all the attention and a much heftier contract, which meant less money for him. Kobe, on the other hand, reportedly told Lakers management that Shaq was lazy and he wasn't going to be back if Shaq remained on the team. Whether it was Kobe forcing him out or Shaq forcing himself out, nevertheless, the two of them weren't going to work out. And with Shaq getting older, the team sided with Kobe. Lakers former assistant coach Tex Winter stated, O'Neal left because he couldn't get what he wanted, a huge pay raise. There was no way ownership could give him what he wanted. Shaq's demands held the franchise hostage, and the way he went about it didn't please the owner too much. And finally, at number one, Wilt Chamberlain. Now this was a very interesting one, and probably the first time in NBA history where a superstar really forced the hand of the organization. In 1968, Chamberlain was playing for the 76ers, and doing quite well, actually. In the previous year, he won his first ever championship, after struggling against the Celtics for a decade. In 1968, he lost to the Celtics, again, and shortly after, he demanded a trade. The reasons for him demanding it were a bit unclear at first. Many speculated he was just frustrated with losing to the Celtics over and over again, and he demanded to be traded to Los Angeles because he yearned the LA spotlight. That was the simplest explanation, but there were details left unseen. Years later, Wilt claimed that former Sixers co-owner Ike Richman, who briefly owned the team from 1963 to 1965, promised Wilt equity in the team. He basically promised Wilt a part-time ownership stake in the Sixers. Unfortunately, Richmond suddenly passed away in 1965 and the new Sixers owner, Irv Kozlov, had no intention of giving Wilt equity in the team. Honestly, I'm not even sure if that was legal to do so back then. Nowadays, I believe if you're an active NBA player, you can't own any stakes in an NBA team. I don't know, maybe it was allowed back in the day. Either way, Wilt was unhappy he was no longer getting equity in the Sixers, so he demanded a trade. In an article by Jack Ramsey, if he did not get traded, he was apparently going to jump to the ABA. They were losing him regardless. It hurt a lot too. They gave up the guy who was, at the time, the greatest NBA player ever, for a bunch of scraps. For Wilt, this paired him up with two all-time players in Jerry West and Elgin Baylor. So at least he was happy now. Anyway, those were 10 NBA superstars who forced their team to trade them. I know this was a long video, but if you're still here, thank you so much for watching through it. What are your thoughts on these trade scenarios? Do you think, in the future, the NBA would put more protections for the team to not lose so much if a player forces a trade? Of course, we already have things like trade exceptions, but in scenarios like with Kawhi or Anthony Davis, it seemed like their teams couldn't do anything but cave in to their demands. Or else they'll just sit on the sidelines. Is this a problem that needs to be addressed? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching. And, of course, I'll see you next time. Peace.